everyone a very good day to all of you so in this video i dr uh, swati verma mentor from study medic would be talking about some important exam tested topics from the module antenatal care so let's first start with multiple pregnancy we all know that types of twins are basically divided on the basis when cleavage occurred in the embryo if cleavage occurs in the early stages of morula itself that is between days 1 to 3 it results in dichorionic diamniotic they both have got separate chorions and amniotic sacs if cleavage occurs after uh, day 3 that is between day 4 and day 8 in the blastocyst stage then chorion is shared between the two em uh, embryos and amnion is separate that is monochorionic diamniotic twins if cleavage occurs still further days between days 8 to 13 in the implanted blastocyst stage then chorion as well as amnion is shared that is mcma twin results and if cleavage occurs still afterwards that is between days 13 to 15 they result in conjoined twins so this is the ultrasound picture of dcda twins here there are two thick chorionic sacs each surrounding the embryo here it is monochorionic diamniotic twins that is one thick chorionic sac is there surrounding both the embryos and each embryo is surrounded by its own thin amnion and mcma twins where is there is just one thick echogenic chorion and one thin amnion and both am embryos are lying inside a single amniotic sac so these are the ultrasound pictures of the different types of twins one very important exam tested question is based on the sign that is the lambda sign which is found in dichorionic twins here both chorion and amnion are a part of this membrane and another one is the t sign where only the thin amnion is the part of membrane that is a feature of monochorionic twin giving the shape of t sign now let's uh, study about monochorionic twins and their specific complications many complications are there out of which the most important one and most frequently tested one is the ttts syndrome it is also known as fetal fetal transfusion syndrome or twin oligopoly sequence that is tops it is peculiar to mcda pregnancy here there is presence of oligo in one sac and polyhydramnios in the other sac the cause basically is an imbalance in the vascular connections within the placenta leading to increased perfusion and uh, polyhydramnios around one of the twins and less amniotic fluid around the other twin so basic diagnostic feature is oligopoly that is oligo in one poly in the other how it will be measured oligo means deepest vertical pocket will be less than 2 cm in the donor twin and poly means deepest vertical pocket will be more than 8 cm before 20 weeks and more than 10 cm after 20 weeks gestation but now we have to stage the ttts when it starts getting worsening bladder gets uh, invisible means bladder of the donor twin we can't see if this is the case that means we are dealing with quintero stage 2 of ttts it occurs because of severe oligo in the donor due to anuria bladder gets invisible but in stage 2 doppler studies will be uh, will be normal but if doppler studies start getting critically abnormal in either the donor or the recipient that is typically abnormal umbilical artery doppler will be there then it becomes stage 3 so stage 3 will manifest doppler abnormalities in the umbilical artery or vein when recipient twin starts getting features of hydrops that is either ascites pericardial effusion or pleural effusion scalp edema or overt hydrops then it becomes stage 4 and if any of the twins we lose that is fetal demise happens then it becomes stage 5 so then it is not amenable to therapy so this staging ttts is very very important now how to screen since it's a 
complication peculiar to MCDA twins. So we recommend screening from 16 weeks onwards at every two week intervals through ultrasound examination. Fetal biometry and liker volumes have to be recorded. The woman has to be called frequently at two weekly intervals from 16 weeks onwards. Regarding treatment, mostly this TTTS develops between 16 to 26 weeks. So most common treatment is endoscopic laser coagulation of the anastomotic vessels. This is the first line treatment which is offered. Rarely it may develop after 26 weeks for which second line treatments like amnio reduction or septostomy may be done. But most common is this. How to screen or how to monitor women after that? We basically monitor by weekly ultrasound assessment, including uh, this will obviously be done by fetal medicine specialists. Fetal brain, heart and limbs will be examined and serial measurements of umbilical artery pulsatility index, MCA PSV and ductus venosus Doppler velocities should be performed. Now, after two weeks of post treatment, the ultrasound interval, if all these things are normal, the ultrasound interval can be increased to every two weeks. Now it is not necessary weekly. Every two weeks it can be done. And yes, since treated TTTS uh, in these uh, patients, fetal heart anomalies are common. So ultrasound examination of fetal heart should ideally be done by fetal medicine specialist. And such cases should be delivered by between 34 to 36 plus 6 weeks of gestation. So this was in brief about TTTS. Now next common complication is TAPS. This as such an uncomplicated MCDA just occurs in 2% cases, but it may occur in up to 13% of monochorionic twins post laser ablation. If this has not been performed properly, it may occur in up to 13% of monochorionic twins after they have been treated for TTTS. Here what happens? There is normal fluid bladder and all is visible but one twin develops anemia and one twin develops polycythemia however oligopoly sequence is not there so donor develops anemia that is when we screen her, uh, donors mca psv it is more than 1.5 mom donor mca psv will be more than 1.5 mom and recipient mca psv will be less than 1.1 1 .1 mom that is polycythemia so recipient develops polycythemia less than one mom and donor develops anemia that is more than 1.5 mom. So this condition is known as twin anemia polycythemia sequence. For this uh, condition, laser surgery, blood transfusion that is exchange transfusion after the babies are born. We might need to deliver the babies early or if everything goes on well on monitoring, we can watch and wait. These treatment modalities can be followed. Another very important complication for monochorionic diamniotic twins is selective fetal growth restriction. Here what happens, we start monitoring for fetal, uh, this SFGR condition, we start screening for SFGR condition from 20 weeks onwards. For TTTS, we were screening 16 weeks onwards. For SGR, we are screening from 20 weeks onwards. And if the discordance is that of more than 20%, that is EFW of larger twin minus smaller twin upon larger twin. EFW of larger twin minus EFW of smaller twin upon EFW of larger twin multiplied by 100 comes out to be more than 20% or more than 25% according to NICE. Then it comes in the category of selective fetal growth restriction. So here basically it's a disorder based on placental pathology. More nutrients and more oxygen is going to one twin, so it becomes larger and the second twin becomes compromised. Here again, we categorize it in two stages. If there is just growth discordance and Doppler, velocity, Doppler flow is all normal, then it comes in stage one. That is, we check for diastolic velocities. If it is positive in both the twins, umbilical artery diastolic velocity, then it is stage one. If end diastolic velocity is either absent or reversed but it is constantly absent or constantly reversed in one or both fetuses then it is stage two but if 
cyclical abnormality is there means cyclical umbilical artery diastolic waveform is there in the form of like first it's positive then absent then reversed again over several minutes it's following a cyclical kind of abnormality means first positive then absent then reversed so if this is happening over several minutes it is called as intermittent aredv and that qualifies for stage 3 sgr again it's important that we know when to deliver such babies in type 1 sgr it's sort of similar to sga we can continue monitoring and whenever monochorionic twins are supposed to get delivered that is by 34 to 36 weeks of gestation we can plan delivery a bit earlier plan delivery should be considered by 34 to 36 weeks if everything is going on normal and like a artery doppler waveforms are normal but if not that is they are falling in category of 2 or 3 then we have to plan delivery by 32 weeks just like in sga when we plan delivery by 32 weeks if there is any absent or reversed end diastolic flow we deliver by 32 weeks so similarly here also we have to deliver by 32 weeks next is twin reversed arterial perfusion just know what happens in this incidence is quite low just 1% of monochorionic twins here this is a cardiac twin it has got no cardiac tissue and this anatomically normal twin is called as pump twin this is a cardiac twin and this is pump twin this twin is uh, supplying actually perfusing the a cardiac twin through a large artery to artery anastomosis on the surface of placenta so here this twin becomes at risk of heart failure because it is basically supplying everything all the uh, blood to the second twin so its treatment is basically in the form of radio frequency ablation of this artery to artery anastomosis so that that we can get uh, actually the normal twin should at least be saved now let's solve questions in the form of emqs This is a 27 year old primary she is being followed up with regular scans as part of monitoring of MCD8 twin now she is at 26 weeks and on ultrasound scan EFW discordance is 25% that means it is SFGR with positive velocities in both I'm like a lottery doppler that means it is SFGR type grade 1 stage 1 Ultrasound scan performed on 24 year old with MCD at 20 weeks. EFW discordance is 15%. That means it is not SFGR. Single DVP in smaller twin is less than two. Larger twin is more than eight. The bladders of both twins are seen, and MC MCA Doppler results of both babies are also normal. So it qualifies for TTTS. It is TTTS. and it is stage 1 since bladder is visible doppler results are normal a follow up scan of monochorionic twins at 24 weeks showed discordant growth oligopoly sequence and abnormal umbilical artery doppler velocities in both twins as well as reversed flow velocities in the ductus venosus doppler of the recipient twin furthermore there is presence of ascites and pleural effusion in scalp edema now since here there is oligopoly sequence means ttts is there and since features of hydrops is are there in the recipient so it is ttts stage 4 so the answer is ttts stage 4 now this primary with mcd a twin on ultrasound scan at 28 weeks efw discordance of 25% means it is sfgr sfgr but there is neither oligo nor poly means it is not ttts umbilical artery doppler of smaller twin shows absent end diastolic flow nothing like sort of intermittent or cyclical thing is there but there is end diastolic flow in the second twin so it qualifies for sfgr stage 2 32 year old follow up ultrasound scan at 26 weeks reveals EFW discordance of 10%. Normal Likert volume in both fetuses means neither SFGR nor oligopoly means not TTTS. MCA PSV of one twin is more, other twin is less. So then it qualifies for TAPS. That is twin anemia polycythemia sequence. Whenever MCA PSV abnormalities are there, you think about anemia polycythemia. 
so this is taps ultrasound scan on 30 year old gravida 4 para 3 being followed up with serial scans because monochorionic twins is there ultrasound scan efw discordance of 25% with sdvp liker of 7 cm in larger twin 2.5 cm in smaller twin umbilical artery doppler velocities shows a cyclical pattern now here it is sfgr oligopoly not qualified cyclical pattern with intermittent positive absent and reversed that means it is sfgr stage 3 so now i think sga uh, this not sg uh, ttts and other complications of monochorionic twins might be clear let's come to important points regarding red cell antibodies and antd now whenever there are clinically significant antibodies in the form of either anti c anti d or anti k then we have to monitor every 4 weeks or monthly up to 28 weeks and then two weekly till delivery for all the clinically significant antibodies whether it is dck monitor monthly for 28 up to 28 weeks and then two weekly till delivery regarding the titers anti k antibodies they can lead to severe high drops even at low levels so whenever anti k antibodies are detected whatever the titer refer for further evaluation to fetal medicine specialist regarding anti d antibodies we have to quantify at 4 beyond 4 international units per ml we have to refer for fetal medicine evaluation because between 4 to 15 there is a moderate risk of hdfn and beyond 15 there is severe risk of hdfn similarly for anti c beyond 7.5 you have to refer for fetal medicine evaluation because between 7.5 to 20 there is moderate risk and beyond 20 there is severe risk and in all such women we have to keep on monitoring the fetus through scans mca doppler intrauterine transfusion might be needed in case the fetus develops high drops or anemia and our aim should be to deliver by 37 weeks and send the cord blood for hemoglobin bilirubin and direct antiglobulin test so this ideally should be followed for antibodies now regarding anti d administration for all the potentially sensitizing events during pregnancy how they follow for gestational age less than 12 weeks if uh, it's best to follow the nice guideline as such that is for surgical management of ectopic pregnancy more than 10 weeks uh, yes surgical for all surgical termination for any uh, intervention beyond 10 weeks for, or for any instrumentation of uterus even beyond, uh, even less than 10 weeks we go for administration of anti d in this dose but for between 12 to 20 weeks again for any potentially sensitizing event we have to give for all administer at least 250 units within 72 hours of the event between 20 weeks to term this dose becomes 500 but along with that we have to request for an fmh test that is a cle hor test and then immediately administer 500 unit within 72 hours one more thing if she is having recurrent vaginal bleeding then at least 500 units anti d is to be administered at a minimum of 6 weekly intervals irrespective of the presence of detectable anti d and cle hor test requested every 2 weeks in case more anti d is needed now as a part of routine antenatal anti d prophylaxis take a blood sample to confirm group and check antibody screen do not wait for results and administer either in the form of single dose 1500 units anti d at 28 to 30 weeks or double dose that is 500 units at 28 weeks and again 500 units at 34 weeks now regarding delivery or diagnosis of iud first if iud is diagnosed any time more than 20 weeks immediately request for a cle hor test and administer 500 units within 72 hours of diagnosis of iud or after delivery of any normal baby not iud we have to administer at least 500 unit within 72 hours of delivery and if on cle hor test it indicates that further anti d may be required we can discuss and administer additional 
so here in this question fetal heart was undetectable and iud was diagnosed at 38 weeks but the mother expressed her preference to go home and return after 24 hours her blood group was negative so ideally after our advice should be first advise a clehort test and administer anti d gamma globulin and then allow her to go home okay regarding this now a 30 year old woman she had a history of cesarean and multiple fibroids and she had massive pph with blood loss of 3 liters since she was uh, she was rh negative also and had transfusion of group specific packed cells reinfusion of salvaged red cells from cell saver and also she was given ffp cryo and platelets cord blood group was done and it was also rhd negative now for which of these would you give anti d prophylaxis would you give for rhd positive ffp no for rhd positive cryo we won't give for rhd positive platelets we need to give for rhd negative packed rbc we won't because it is compatible reinfusion of salvaged red cells you can give because her cord blood group was rhd negative so here for rhd positive platelets if we are transfusing we need to give anti t prophylaxis no anti d required if rhd negative woman receives rhd positive ffp or cryo precipitate because it doesn't matter the platelets should ideally be group compatible if rhd positive platelets are being given to an rhd negative woman of child bearing potential then anti d has to be administered a dose of 250 units is sufficient to cover five adult therapeutic dose of platelets and yes if she is uh, having thrombocytopenia then you need to give it subcutaneously so as to minimize bruising and hematoma now let's come to sga another very important topic now sga is divided into one screening part and another management part first let's do a question based on screening part here she is 25 year old gravida 2 attending the clinic at 15 weeks her previous baby was delivered at 37 weeks with birth weight on first centile that is previous sga that is a major risk factor and our mind should immediately start thinking about what is being followed in the major risk factor flow chart so if we think about major risk factor flow chart it is like we send it for send her for serial assessment of fetal size and umbilical artery doppler from 26 to 28 weeks onwards so this will be in our answer but since she is also having a history of preeclampsia so that means she has to be administered aspirin as well so aspirin 150 mg and serial assessment of fetal size and umbilical artery doppler from 26 to 28 weeks this should be our best answer this chart is again really very very important we have to be aware of these minor risk factors if three or more of these minor risk factors are present then we have to send her for umbilical uterine artery doppler uterine artery doppler at 20 to 24 weeks if on this everything is normal we can just advise her to undergo fetal size and umbilical artery doppler scan once in third trimester that is around 32 weeks it is sufficient but if not or in the presence of any of this major risk factor whether she is previous sga maternal or paternal sga whether she smokes more than 11 cigarettes per day chronic hypertension previous stillbirth all these are major risk factors so no need to carry out uterine artery doppler at 20 to 24 weeks or if she is pap a less than 0.4 or fetal ecogenic bowel any of this also qualifies as a major risk factor and she will have to undergo serial assessment of fetal size and umbilical artery doppler from 26 to 28 weeks onwards okay now let's come to management part this was like we are screening management involves like already ac or efw is lying below 10th centile then what to do let's understand its management through some questions pay attention to these options and let's solve based on these options 28 year old woman she is in her second pregnancy followed up in fetal growth clinic on the 
account of previous SGA baby. Now her screening ultrasound was being carried out at 26 weeks, at 30 weeks. It showed crossing of centile lines by the AC of the fetus. That means it is getting less, but not beyond, not below 10 centile. Serial fortnightly scans were arranged and last one was done at 36 weeks. Here the baby's AC was below 10 centile, but liker volume was normal and umbilical artery Doppler was normal. So first column of the management of SG algorithm will be followed. Here we, can, we will be happy to deliver the baby at 37 weeks with involvement of a senior clinician. Why? Because here umbilical artery Doppler is normal. <clears throat> So here are offer delivery by 37 weeks with involvement of a senior clinician. Now, second scenario here, primary with severely growth restricted fetus at 29 weeks. Here our ultrasound is showing oligo. Umbilical artery Doppler is abnormal with absent end diastolic flow, but a normal ductus venosus. So here we need to deliver her a bit early since she is 29 weeks, we would like to administer her steroids. And with absent diast end diastolic flow, we prefer her to deliver between 30 to 32 weeks. So we will cort give corticosteroids and recommend delivery at 30 to 32 weeks. Because here she will fall in this column. So recommend delivery before 32 weeks after steroids. If ductus venosus Doppler were abnormal, then we recommend immediate delivery after steroids. But if ductus venosus Doppler is normal, then we will consider her delivery at 30 to 32 weeks. Okay. By 32 weeks, it is recommended to deliver after steroids if absent or reversed end diastolic flow is there. In the presence of ductus venosus Doppler abnormality, even earlier. So here answer will be recommend delivery at 30 to 32 weeks. Now the third scenario. A 35-year-old Gravida 3 para 2, previous two SGA babies. Now she is third, 35 weeks pregnant for third time. Again, she was diagnosed with SGA at 28 weeks and is being followed up with regular growth scans. Okay, at 28 weeks only, she was SGA again. Now she is undergoing regular growth scans and Doppler assessment again. Her ultrasound today shows a breach presentation. Now she is 35 weeks breach with static AC less than 10 centile. That is, there is no appreciable change from the last measurement three weeks previously. SDVP of 1.7 and umbilical artery Doppler shows PIRI more than 95th centile. That is, she falls in the second column. Umbilical artery Doppler, PIRI more than 2 SD. EDV present. But one thing catch here is no appreciable change from last measurement. It means growth is static over three weeks. So here we will have to consider delivery more than 34 weeks if static growth over three weeks. And she's already more than 34 weeks. She's 35 weeks. So we will plan her delivery. Now, how her delivery will be carried out since she is breech presentation. It would be recommend, recommended to carry out a cesarean for her. So you will consider steroids if delivery by CS is to occur. So here, corticosteroids and CS would be the best answer. Hope it's clear, guys. This table is extremely important for you all to know regarding management of SGA. Now let's have a look at some of the pictures of abnormal fetuses. Here, this is a very peculiar picture of uh, Anin Kefli. Here, frog eyes are there. Anin Kefli, absent cranium. Here, whenever they write heart and stomach at same level, that is, stomach lies in the thorax. That means there is a defect in diaphragm and congenital diaphragmatic hernia should be your answer. Here, this is a section of abdominal circumference and these are the bowel. Wherever ecogenic bowel, uh, ecogenicity you find in the bowel, you can safely tell it as ecogenic bowel. Now here, viscera is protruding in the amniotic fluid, but it is covered in a regular sac. It is covered in a regular sac. So it is like uh, this is omphalocele. And since here the viscera are lying freely in the amniotic fluid without any covering. So it's gastrochysis. Omphalocele is associated with more anomalies. So it is it has a worse prognosis as compared to gastrochysis. 
<coughs> now you have to identify this syndrome. This is clinodectyly, hypoplastic nails, horseshoe kidneys, low set ears. But most prominent feature is rocker bottom feet. Rocker bottom feet is very peculiar of Edwards syndrome. Whereas here in this syndrome, you can see holoprosencephaly is there, cleft lip palate is there, means midline abnormalities are there. So it is very suggestive of trisomy 13 or Patau syndrome. So our answers will be like this. Now these levels are very important. All levels are low in trisomy 18. Beta HCG and inhibin A will be high in trisomy 21. Whereas only high inhibin A, whereas rest all low will be there in trisomy 13. So it's also a very important question. Another very important topic is female genital mutilation. They might give you features and you may be asked to identify this type. So if clitoridectomy alone has been carried out, it's type 1. If it is accompanied with excision of minora or majora, then it is type 2. Most commonly, they ask about infibulation. Here, vaginal orifice is narrowed and sealed. So it is type 3. Any other harmful procedure is type 4. Now, in these type of cases, you will have to refer her to psychosexual counselor, offer her consultant-led appointment, additionally screen her for hepatitis C. Recording and reporting is mandatory. If any female less than 18 years appears to be at risk, or comes to you with history of FGM. It is mandatory to report to police within one month. And reinfibulation is a big no. It is illegal and not to be followed at all. Now, lastly, few things about placenta previa. Here it is important that we are aware of the GTG. Algorithm of placenta previa says that Whenever you diagnose a low-lying placenta or placenta previa at anomaly scan that is between 18 to 22 weeks or at 16 weeks, it is necessary that you repeat a scan, including PVS if required at 32 weeks. So here best answer would be at 32 weeks you can repeat. Mrs. Ruby Primey with asymptomatic placenta previa at 32 weeks, you administer steroid at 34 to 36 weeks. And scan again at around 36 weeks if still previa, schedule her cesarean between 36 to 37 weeks gestation. If recurrent spotting is happening at 32 weeks, then you have to administer steroids before 34 weeks itself and schedule cesarean between 34 to 36 weeks. So here at 36 to 37 weeks in asymptomatic previa, in symptomatic previa between 34 to 36 weeks. But in these two cases, if low-lying placenta or asymptomatic low-lying placenta, here you can skip ultrasound examination. Or if she is asymptomatic low-lying placenta, you can repeat ultrasound scan at 36 weeks. If still low-lying, you can leave her for individualized decision around the time of delivery. So this uh, flowchart should be very clear in your minds. And lastly, regarding Jehovah's Witness acceptability and restrictions, it is necessary that white cells, red cells, platelets, and FFP are absolutely not acceptable, whereas crystalloids and colloids are acceptable, and there may be individualized decision or acceptability in terms of albumin, anti-D, coagulation factors, cryoprecipitate, means they may or may not accept. Lastly, a review regarding important numbers. Number of antenatal appointments in uncomplicated Nulliparus 10, in uncomplicated Multiparus 7, DCDA 8, MCDA 11. And these are detailed appointments with scans and timing of delivery, very, very important to know. Of this, MCDA and DCDA, very important. Also, by 32 weeks, we have to deliver MCMA as well as SGA with absent or reversed end diastolic velocity and in other conditions, also very advanced maternal age, previous stillbirth, you have to deliver by 38 weeks. Regarding mode of delivery, MCMA, tri, uh, triplets, placenta previa, you have to deliver by C-section. So that was all, guys. Hope it helps you and all the very best for your exams. Thank you.